Welcome to the Building Your Brand Workshop. This is for people from every level of experience, so even if you have no idea what branding, building, or your means, we can help you with all of those things. If you have a little bit more experience, we're going to talk about some more headier concepts, a little bit more academic, if you will. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess let's get going. Um, just a quick, just I guess off the top, just to explain the way I am imagining doing this, seeing what you guys think. I'm going to have to walk around the room and meet all you guys because I want to be able to at least have some aspect of your name in my mind. Um, but I think we're going to talk a little bit about just some base overarching concepts of branding, what that means, a brand, a story, a narrative, an aspiration, a product, both in terms of corporations and individuals. Um, we're going to go into how to turn that into something for you and your personal brand as a creative professional, as other creative professionals. We are constantly seeking to somehow make ourselves stand out um, from the effulgence of content that is being pumped out by every person all the time, 25 hours a day, 365 and a quarter days a year. Um, it's too much, it's overwhelming. How do you make yourself stand out? We're going to talk about that for a little bit. Uh, we're going to look at some examples of that. Um, then I would like to leave space at the end for, depending on how fast I talk, for, for some questions and also because people are coming into this from very different levels of technical proficiency, and I'm talking about like the creative cloud, and or just, you know, background with creative things, and design, and graphics, and all that stuff. Some of you guys in here may be like postdoctoral, you know, graduate graphic designers, and that does exist. Harvard has a doctorate program in graphic design. It's very interesting, actually. Um, or maybe you never heard of any of those words, and you don't know anything about the color wheel or anything like this, and that's fine, too. Um, so I want to leave space at the end to address some of those topics and those questions. Um, what I would like to do, since this is going to be a two-part workshop, is talk about this stuff today, um, hear your feedback on it, and then also then send you guys off into the world and to return a week from today with some work having been done on your personal brand. Now, some of you guys being creative professionals already have a very, shall we say, robust, you know, experience, uh, personal brand. Maybe you've been doing stuff on your own for a while, maybe you've been working on it for a while. Maybe some of you don't even know what those words mean, and that's fine. Um, by the end of today, you will know what that means, and you will be able to go out into the world and create something that represents yourself, your narrative, your story, what sets you apart from everybody else, from the other million beautiful snowflakes, you know, all pursuing their dreams. So, uh, any questions about that? That's a lot of talking already. No? Okay, good. Thank God. <laughs> all right. Um, so, hello. Hello. Um, I'm Leslie Andrew Ridings. Here's my information. If you uh, want to reach out to me, if you want to send me an email, if you have any questions or anything, this is my company's website. I uh, run a small, I guess, sort of like content production company. We do a lot of music videos and stuff like that. Um, uh, I met some of you when you first came in. Who did I not meet? I want to go by everybody. I want to get everybody. Who, who, whose name is not? Who's not said their name to me? You said your name to me. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a lot of faces in here. Miss, what was your name? Jedan. How did you say that? Jedan. Jedan. Yeah. Leslie, hi, how are you? Where are you from? I'm Istanbul, Turkey. Istanbul, Turkey, okay, great. There's a, there's a, they might be giant song, which I will not repeat. But, um, how about you, sir? Um, I'm Kartik. Hi, Kartik, where are you from? Seattle. Seattle, beautiful city, go, go, Mariners. I'm from Los Angeles. Who else? Uh, I didn't meet you too. I'm from Pasadena. Pasadena? Excellent. What's your name? Nate. Nate. Pasadena. I grew up in La Pacenta. Oh, really? And I went to St. Francis. Oh, you went to St. Francis? I sure did. I went to St. Francis. Well, hey, well, there we go. Something <laughs> something common. I bet I graduated a longer time ago than you, though. <laughs> okay, all right. Don't be so sure. All right? It could have been relatively recent. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's true. Uh, and you, sir? Russell. Russell. Hi, where are you from, Russell? I'm from Torrance. Near Torrance. I do know where Torrance is. A lot of good breweries in Torrance. That's true. Don't draw any conclusions of my character by my knowledge of that. Um, pleasure to meet you, Russell. Who else did I not meet by your mess? Zoe. Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Where are you from? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I hear it's a great town. My friends say that I need to go to Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. And I'll have done the circuit of great cities in, in the country. Sir, how about you? Davide. Davide. Where are you from? Italy. Italy. All right. Yeah. Uh, what part of Italy? South. Sicily. The south is down in the south. The south is, the south is you can south. It's almost Carthage. Um, great. Well, uh, I don't know how to say welcome, I forgot. You didn't study in Italy. What's that? You didn't study in Italy. 
I, I didn't study in Italy, although I traveled there right after studying here, and I spent like three months there, so I can't remember that. Well, anyway, buongiorno. Uh, <laughs> all right, who did I miss? Anybody else on this side? I see a few faces in the back. Miss? Uh, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I'm Leslie. Where are you from? I'm from Highland Park, Los Angeles. You're originally from Highland Park? Sure. Originally from Highland Park? Originally from Highland Park. That's great. I'm very glad to hear that. I'm from not too far away, as you as we yeah, discussed. Yeah. Well, cheers. Um, miss, I meet you. From where? Awesome. Okay. Cool. Who's next? That's right. That's right. We did. Okay. Yes. Sorry. It was a huge lecture hall. You know, very, very academic. It was very removed and professional. We'll get to see you again. All right. And I did I meet you? No. No. Well, what is it? Uh, my name is Alice, and uh, I'm from China. Okay. Great. Well, pleasure to meet you. Anybody here want to be thrown up the chopping block? I'm sorry. I like doing this. We got to it. I'll rush the rest. Hi there. I'm Azzy. Hi, I'm Azzy. Yes, I'm also originally from Turkey, from Ankara. From oh, Ankara, okay. The other, the other city. The main one. The main one. Oh, <laughs> did you hear that? Did you hear what that? is it? She said she's from Ankara, and I said the other city, and she's like, you mean the main city. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm KP. I'm from New Delhi. Hi, how are you? It's a long ways away. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Christine. I'm from Pasadena. Excellent. Another local. Leslie from nearby there. I'm Yossi. I'm from Kentucky. From Kentucky? Great. I don't, I don't have too much to say about Kentucky, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm originally in Beijing, China. Awesome. And I spent four years in Macau. Macau? Okay. I don't even know if I know what Macau is. Oh, you don't know? Do I? Oh, it's a, it's a place near Hong Kong. <laughs> okay. It's called Eastern Las Vegas. That's right. It's where you go and you race F1 cars and play cards, right? And like, spin the roulette wheel. Yes? I never met you. Hi, Mia. Leslie, pleasure to meet you. I'm Selena. I'm also from China. Okay, great. Pleasure to meet you. I've met you, miss. And I'm Carrie, and I'm from D.C. Carrie, all right. D.C., great town. Great town. One of my favorite bands is from there. Bad Brains. Like Bad Brains are like punk music? I'm not a huge punk. Okay, well, that's right. Nobody's, nobody's perfect. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm Maxine. I'm from China. Fantastic. Pleasure to meet you. Hi, Korea from London. Oh, well, uh, God save the Queen. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, there you go. Um, God save the Commonwealth. Um, and last two ladies? Uh, I'm Dubai. Dubai? Okay, fantastic. I, that's a mysterious country. We'll talk about the land. I'm curious about that country. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Megan from Philly. Megan from Philly. There you go. No, another Philly person. There you go. Go Phillies. Go, uh, what do you guys, it's the Phillies, and what's the, is it the Eagles yeah. that you guys, yeah, big crazy Eagles, do you guys like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Yes. I love that show, I love that show, and what do they call the riot juice that they drink, like the big like milk tubs full of blue alcohol, anyway, whatever, that's another conversation, okay, let's get started, alright guys, thank you for indulging me, really brief, uh, I like to uh, sort of have a pretty convivial discussion kind of space in the classroom, so please talk with me. I'm not just shouting at you. This is a conversation. I'm raising questions. I'm asking them to you. I'm asking them of myself as well. So let's all share it together in this and talk about it and give me your ideas. I'll give you mine. And at the end of the day, hopefully somebody will learn something somewhere. Um, so today we are going to have a brief introduction to branding, intentionality of design, and standing out in the digital marketplace. Wow, that's a lot of words. Um, that's a lot of stuff, but I think probably the word in here which stands out and if I had some cool powers to make things have effects, it would be this word right here. What is that word? Intentionality. Intentionality. What is intentionality? Just say it. Doing something purposefully. Doing something purposefully. Dig into that. Open that up a little bit more. Somebody else, next level. What does that mean to do something purposefully? Strategically. Strategically. With a goal in mind. I want to achieve this. And that is why I'm doing that. Now, I don't know how many of you guys are comm majors or marketing people, or I don't know where you guys all come from, um, and or what your goals are, but you will find, and the people of you who are involved in these fields, like marketing, communication, including graphic design, the arts, um, film, all these things, understand that intentionality is the basis of everything that you do in a creative marketplace, because that is <coughs> what defines what you make, who you make it for, how you make it, and how you drive that message home. Now, branding is no different, right? What is branding? What is branding, Dave? Um, 
Well, coming off that big long spiel about intentionality, what do you th what do you guys think branding is? This is a question. I mean, I'm asking you honestly. I mean, tell me, tell me what branding is. Make my job easy. I'm lazy. Wow, that, that, that's a, I love that definition a lot. Who you want to be, how you, deciding that, how you present to the world a, uh, on a across medium, right? So like sort of uh, with, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Where you're always doing the same thing over and over again? Consistency, I have that in there somewhere. Consistency, that's good, I like that. Um, so it's sort of like this manufacturing of something, sure. Any, any other takers? Those are all true. All those words are true. It's about identity. But the one that I'm really reacting to is the term story. It's a story it's based on its base, base level. Because even when you're deciding who you are and deciding how you present yourself and deciding how I'm going to do this you know, with consistency across all the digital media spectrum and you know, on Instagram and on YouTube and in life, I'm going to wear stuff that looks like this. And it's all part of a story that you're weaving. It's a narrative. It's something you're telling people. It is to some degree artifice, as is everything, I might argue. It's getting philosophical, not beyond the scope of this lecture. But it is a story. It's a narrative. It can be aspirational. It can be intimidating. It can be welcoming. It can be subversive. It is a story told through design. It is a story told intentionally. And ultimately, when it comes down to branding for a company or for an individual, uh, it's because you're trying to sell something, right? As, an, as individual professional creatives, we want to sell ourselves. Wow, look at that website. Look at that business card. That sure is sharp. That sure speaks to what I want. Aspirational. You know, when you walk into Urban Outfitters, what are they selling you? They're not selling you a t-shirt. What are they selling you? Lifestyle. 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 That's right. There's something very unique that has happened. There has been a huge upswing of it in the post sort of internet, digital media, social media revolution and is, is the rise of something which has always existed, but now they're everywhere. Neighborhoods define themselves by them. Crowds of people, demographics of people, cultural bubbles of people define themselves by them. The lifestyle shop. Have you guys been to one of these? You guys never been to a lifestyle shop? No? You probably have. You probably have. If you've been to an urban outfit, you've been to a lifestyle shop. You walk down, go down to the arts district downtown, you walk in, it's like, well, yes, we sell vintage American denim and, you know, quality leather goods. And maybe there's an old motorcycle in the corner. None of us ride motorcycles, of course, but <laughs> you should ride motorcycles. It's a lot of fun. Just be careful. Um, those are lifestyle shops because they're not se it's not about the product you're selling. You're selling you a piece of a lifestyle, an aspirational fragment of artificial reality, right? That's what branding comes down to. You're selling something, you're selling something. How do you make yourself or your product or your company or whatever appeal to people? How do you make it aspirational or a commodity that they want to have? And this is why different companies brand themselves different ways going to different jokes. Well, we're the healthy company. Well, we're the very sleek and high tech and aloof company. And we're not really interested in sitting with you. You know, or we're the everyman company, you know? And if you're a blue collar guy, you want us on your side, right? It's all different stories. Um, and that all comes down to. Again, in the narrative element, getting people to feel something. Triggering something emotionally within a person. That's what it does. And that's what hooks people, right? I look at my, my, uh, my Justin Boots. Long tradition in the American West. Hard-working men. Well, that's me. I'm a hard-working American man. I aspire to traditional American values of individuality and self-determination. I want Justin Boots. Emotional connection. What's this brand story? Turning every, oh. No, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say. I'm okay. paying very acute attention, that's what the story is. Turning every person an athlete, turning every youth person that has body an athlete, behind the Yankees. Just do it, story. Just do it, accomplishment, action. Does anybody know what the actual definition of the term Nike is? The Greek goddess of victory. Genius! <laughs> you were going to say something about the brand story? I was going to say fearlessness. Fearlessness. Kind of going to say that a little bit louder. Did everybody hear that? Um, just to go ahead and do it and be fearless. To 
be fearless, to be bold, to be assertive. Wow. That's a hell of a product. I want to be all those things. Don't you? To jump once more onto the breach with this, I carve my destiny. I have my Nike shoes. I can fly. I can do whatever I want. Um, now, there's a very tactile way in which you can also define and look at the brand story, and that's just by going to their website. When's the last time you guys were on the Nike website? Let's go there real quick. Just give you guys a visual example here. If you guys have your laptop open, you can take a look at this. What are they telling us? What is it saying to us? What what is what is being told to us as we scroll through here? We see this big splash image, stadium to street. What are we being told? Be part of our community. Be part of our community? What community is that? What community of people? Give me some adjectives. Diverse. Diverse. Okay, that's a good one. What were you saying? Fearless people, okay, yeah. Any others? I know you guys are just waiting. Be positive and be cool. Be positive and be cool. Now there's a key word. Cool. What does that mean? What does cool mean? Uh huh. Or be what you be what you perceive to be attractive to others. Be what you perceive to be somehow aspirational, perhaps. Be cool. And you can click through all this and I mean, whatever. They're just ultimately they're selling you shoes. Really, is what they're doing. Um, lifestyle. They're selling you a lifestyle. These are lifestyle shoes, I guess. It's, you know, whatever. But basically, what? So what are they selling you? They're selling you that aspirational story. I want to be cool. I want to be connected. I want to be a dynamic. I want to be bold. I want to be fearless. I want to be the Greek goddess of victory. And it'll only cost you one hundred fifty dollars. We'll ship it right to your door. Isn't that interesting? Intentionality. It's a like everything else, like a bunch of cavemen huddled around, around a fire three million years ago <clears throat> telling stories. It's the same thing. Right. Sorry, I'm waxing. I'll stop. I think I'll start crying. All right. Uh, let's see what the next one is. Let's have some more discussion. This is great. You guys liking this? Is this helping? Yep. Good. How about these guys? Who are these guys? Tom's. <clears throat> What's that? I said get one, give one. Get one, give one. Okay. Well, does everybody know what that means? Everybody is familiar with this brand, yeah? Mm-hmm. What does it mean? Somebody tell me. You donate a pair of shoes for every pair that you buy, and they're very philanthropic in that sense. They're very philanthropic in that sense. Now, I haven't read the literature. I don't know that that's to be true. I feel like that's anecdotal. Yeah. Maybe, like, sort of apocryphal. You know? mm-hmm. But supposedly, the whole sort of understanding is that Tom's on your side and Tom's on the world side and Tom said he's I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a shoe company different from every other shoe company and for every purchase of, sh- of a pair of shoes I will donate a pair of shoes. And you're subsidizing the cost of that pair of shoes so you understand paying a little bit more for it, right? It's for a good cause. Genius. What else is this brand selling? Philanthropy. Philanthropy. Okay, what are some adjectives that you would associate with philanthropy? If, you'd say, if you were to say somebody's philanthropic, other than the act of them giving money to things, what are you really saying about them? What is the underlying subtext? I was going to say, I'm not sure if it's the way you just asked, but they're kind of selling altruism. Like, they're just like, I feel good about myself when I buy songs. Did everybody hear that? Mm-hmm. Everybody in the class, I hope you're, that's good. That's a good point. I am, I, am sell, I am buying altruism. I am buying feeling good about myself. Because I know that unlike those hacks that just want to be cool and buy Nikes, I bought Toms. And yeah, they're not that good looking, and yeah, they're overpriced. Sorry, personal opinion. Um, and yeah, they're overpriced, but you know what? I'm a good person because I bought Toms. And if you're not wearing Toms, guess what? I'm a little bit better than you. Isn't that right? Isn't that the way that we all think? Anything else that they're selling? It's okay if the answer is no. I'm asking you guys. Does anybody know like, what the story is the colors to, the flag? Uh, the founder, Blake, uh, was in Argentina, and he saw children without shoes playing soccer, and that's what led him. And it's, I think, the Argentinian flag? I or believe so, yeah. I think the actual flag is a little crest here, right, where the O would be. Um, well, let's see. Let's take a look at it. Let's see if, let's see if it holds up. Let's see if, if it holds water. <laughs> 
Let's go to their website. Let's see what they're doing. Let's see what they're selling us. They also sell comfort, is what they claim. Comfort? Yeah. Now, in what sense? In the sense that, like, you can buy other shoes and they're really overpriced and they're not, um, but you can't really wear them. They're for everyday use. Yeah. They're selling you things that actually work. <clears throat> So a, a good, honest shoe, perhaps. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. That's good. There you go. With every product you purchase, Tom's helps a person in need. One for one. There you go. Aren't we altruistic? Aren't we good people? Now enslaved. And you see how also, I mean, we saw this in the Nike thing. I didn't touch on it, but I'll touch on it now. Part of this intentionality, remember that big overarching term? If there's one word that you can leave today thinking it's a big flashing neon sign in your brain that says intentionality, intentionality, intentionality. Everything is designed, everything's intentional, everything is soaked and loaded with a warhead of agenda and it's shot right at you to get you to react certain way, whether that be to, to come towards it, to run away from it, to buy it. Agenda, intentionality. So as we look at some of maybe some, and we'll get to the, some principles of design and stuff later on. And again, all you guys who come from like a more art background will be like, oh, yeah, I'm crazy. But for the rest of you, it's important that we cover these. Um, as we look at, say, you know, the way this, this web page is laid out, the colors that are used, the photos, what kind of photos, it's in the photos. How do the photos look? What are the colors in the photos? How do they make us feel? There's a lot of white space here, sort of. Large bold text, smaller black text. I mean, do we, are we drawing any sort of correlations here? Do we see connections between the story of Tom's as a brand, the story of altruism, the story of comfort, the story of, well, I, I wear Tom's, of course, because I'm a good person. You see, I went to college. So. Mm -hmm. um, are we seeing a connection, perhaps, some correlatory lines being drawn from the way that this web page is being presented to their story? Do we see any? I mean, it might not be on its surface. I mean, there's also something to be said for just sort of like fairly neutral design, right? That isn't especially jump out at you. We'll get back to this a little bit later. It also has like a rustic feel. Aha! Because it's a good, honest shoe, perhaps. Yeah. Because it aspires to be the shoe for every person. Remember that little shoeless child in Argentina to the New York Wall Street fat cat out on the lake the weekend with the family. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a pretty family-friendly feeling. Mm-hmm. Comfortable warm, endearing, and aren't these all things for those of you who have more of a background in marketing um, and the uh, sort of perverse manipulations of the truth that our capitalistic society, you know, sort of throws in our face every day, um, are familiar with things like this, so the focus groups, right? How does it make it feel? How does, how does our brand make you feel? What could we do to make it feel more mature, right? And any brand you book about, and all of you guys probably already thought about this, had studies on it, done all these things, read books on it, it's all very intentional, it's just like an onion of like agenda. Right? We all know this. All right. I don't know. I mean, personally, I don't really get Tom's. I mean, I, I think it's nice to help people, but I just don't like them. I don't know. Do you guys like Tom's? <laughs> Wait, on, everybody raise your hand if you would wear a pair of Tom's or if you like Tom's, if you think they're pretty. They're cute. Okay, one, two, three. Wow, okay. So we're a bunch, that's good. We're a bunch of selfish, self motivated people. I like that. That's America. Let's go. All right. You guys, yeah. <laughs> All right, let me see if I can get this keynote going again. Once more, there it is. Okay, so that's interesting, right? Brand story. Here's another really easy one. I don't want to waste too much time on this, but it's just it's important to kind of like go through the strokes, right? And sort of lay a sort of heavy <laughs> foundation that we can build in. What brand is this, I wonder? <laughs> what, pray tell? Apple. Apple. What does Apple sell? Refinement. Refinement. Innovation. Well, I mean, really, they sell computers. Overpriced computers, might I say. <laughs> well, you were going to say something? Innovation. Innovation, right? Think different. Genius. You guys remember? What's that? Genius. Genius. Yes, they have somehow branded themselves. <laughs> and those, I, they have somehow commodified genius. That's us. With that Think Different campaign, right? Everybody remembers that? Mm -hmm. You guys may be a little young, but that you guys are aware of it. Right, where they had photos, for those of you who don't know, they had photos of great thinkers, great men and women, of science, of academics, of letters, of world peace. I think Gandhi was one of them. And they would just have a very simple portrait of that person, and just in the corner, think different, Apple logo. 
You want to be like Gandhi? Well, it's easy. <laughs> Come on into the saddle to the genius bar. Let's get you set up. Um, so they're selling refinement, aspiration, genius. I mean, you mean technically, again, they're selling. Did you have something, sir? Um, I think they sell status. Status. And that's sort of the word that nobody really wants to talk about, but that's kind of what we're talking about with all three brands, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Aren't we? Status. How does Apple sell status? It's a sort of a seductive, sexy, kind of like sinful word. Minimalist status. Yeah. Minimalism? Okay, that's an interesting tie-in. I see that. That's something sort of a convergent thing. A lot of objects of status sort of pre uh, uh, approach is sort of like very austere, minimalist. Well, we don't need trappings. We don't need buckles. Zippers. Their products are expensive, so. So, on a, so on a very base level, <laughs> you, you need to have some status. But we're not we're not saying the word we're not saying like the word that's tied into status. Like what does status mean in our society? Money. Money. It's what I want. Um, I will not sing. Don't worry. I really want to. Um, yes, they're selling all of those things. Refinement. status, aspirations, and real quick, even though you guys are probably on this website all the time because you're very cool, relevant people, let's just go to their, and very, you know, very, very thoughtful sort of citizens of the world. And the funny thing about all these things is, they're, now what they're doing in all three of these pages that we've seen, they're showing us the product that they're selling, right? So it's very, very obvious, it's what we do. But it's all wrapped up, right? <laughs> And all these other things, all these other intentionalities, all these other agendas. The iPhone, a new generation of iPhone, which has, I heard, an all glass body, which to me just sounds beautiful and like an extremely bad idea. <laughs> but hey, whatever. I'm sure it'll sell like hotcakes. And then they got another new one. What is this website saying to us? What is what is this typeface choice saying to us? What is the color choice saying to us? What is the photography saying to us? Sleek. Sleek. What's that one? It's simple. Simple. The future, yeah. But again, minimalism. Uh, simple, high tech, sleek, accessible, fluid, integrated. Status. You look great with your Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> right. Charitable. There's a to some degree, yes, of course. But don't worry, we remember the common man. <laughs> Those less in need who can't afford Apple. What's that? I said all the way at the bottom. All the way at the bottom. But it's there. So if you're like, well, I don't know. Maybe I should just get a PC like the layman. You don't want to be like the layman. Even the layman doesn't want to be like the layman. The layman wants to be like you. Anyway. So yeah, all those things. Does anybody have one of these? A Apple Watch? One of my buddies had one briefly. It just seemed like sort of a much ado about nothing. It's like you got one in your pocket. But eh, whatever, what do I know? All right, let's go back to, uh, okay, I got one more, one more. This one's a little bit different, but I like it. What's this one? This might, I, think, I don't think this is international. This is probably just national, but does anybody, does anybody know what this company is? Camping Outdoor Gear. Camping Outdoor Gear. And for those of you who are familiar with them, what do they sell? Outdoor Adventure. Adventure. The rugged outdoor. Not that sells really well in America. Adventure. The last frontier. The open range. Get on my horse and ride. When are you going to be back, honey? Later. <laughs> Whatever I want. I would say, arguably, does anybody have anything else that they want to add to this brand narrative? No? Miss? Uh, Anti-corporatism. Anti-cor... That's great. That's exactly right. Thank you. You gave me exactly what I wanted. Happy birthday to me. Thank you. <laughs> Anti-corporatism. Does anybody know why they would sell that? You might be more familiar with the company. Why don't you let them know? Yeah. Um, so it's a co-op. So it's, a, it's not a corporation. Mm -hmm. It's member-owned. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like, I get a dividend at the end for mm -hmm. everything that I put in. Put in <coughs> Yeah, and and one of their like more genius like marketing ploys, and and you know it's cool. I mean, I guess they kind of have to kept honest by it, but you actually can get dividends from sales, and you get discounts and stuff. I myself am a card carrying member of REI, so I've bought into the narrative into 
all this cool, beautiful outdoors, and dogs with backpacks, and <laughs> and it's so funny too because I'm I'm an avid outdoorsman. I love going camping and stuff like that. And the stuff they sell, the RA sells is like this. Ask, it's like the Apple of camping gear. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like I want to get a tent. It's like yeah, well I got one from Target. It's like twenty bucks. You go to REI. Well, do you want the Polaris Two or the Ultra Extra Exo Adventure Series? And it's like, oh, it's like two thousand dollars for a tent. It's like yes, but you can use the camp in Mount Everest. It's like I'm going to Angeles for crafts. Like I don't. Need <laughs> I'm, I'm car camping. I wouldn't be drunk the whole time. <laughs> And they have all this beautiful gear. What is the design telling us here? What is the photography and the colors telling us? Nature, it's like green. Yeah, a lot of earth tones. Sparse, again, that minimal, the white space, the sort of like open, spacey. Like, yes, you have room to breathe. It's the internet, you see. So it backs up the brand narrative. They also aren't selling like people who are super, super fit, so it also helps with their brand. Like you don't have to be, you can be this if this model was here right now and heard you say that, I'd probably be a little hurt. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's well, like sort of... If you look back, like, all the way, like, you, you can't really tell. Like, they're not focused on... They're normal people. Yeah. But they are normal people. And I would say that holds up through their, through their marketing. And, uh... And also diversity. Because I feel like the, in the picture, we can see different, um, different people. They're maybe older, they're younger. And mm -hmm. So everyone can wear that. Everybody can be part of the adventure. Even the dog. Even, even the dog. dog. <laughs> yes, you can buy overpriced camping gear even for your dog. <laughs> Why should little Bowser stay at home when he can come along and carry your six-pack? <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> um, have you guys seen those? They have dog backpacks. Yeah. <laughs> That's man's best friend right there. Um, all right. Enough with that. Well, I hope that's helpful, kind of like pulling, you know, kind of dissecting and discussing a little bit the, uh, some brand narratives, because the thing is, we see them, you know, taken for granted, but we just kind of accept it, right? Like, there's this weird acculturation that happens with branding and marketing where you just see it, and we all kind of talk that language to some degree, you know what I mean? Like, we all kind of understand what they're selling us, or we understand kind of what we perceive and have been given to perceive of those brands. Um, but it's good to sort of sit down and be like, well, let's talk about it. Let's unpack that a little bit. So that's what I was trying to do with you guys. So, you've seen those stories. Now when we turn and think about us as professional creatives, or just professionals, what is our story? What is your story? Who wants to volunteer? I want to hear some stories. Tell me some stories. Anybody? Um, like that's close enough to a volunteer. <laughs> what's your name and what's your story? Carolyn, I'm an international, well-traveled, presumably well-read and sophisticated. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I listen to classical music, but I also listen to pop music, too. I'm no snob. Um, creative. So how would so that's your story. And you would then perhaps seek to brand yourself in such a way. So you obviously use Apple computers and shop at REI and you know some other brands. You just maybe you guys just say, like, North Face with you or... <coughs> Isn't that interesting how many inferences we can draw on people? And oftentimes right because we self-categorize. Everybody does it. I do it too. About how we plug ourselves into pre-existing roles and narratives. Who else has got a story? <coughs> I'm going to pick somebody if you don't want to volunteer. You're going to have to do it because I'm a teacher and I said so. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a future diplomat who likes craft beer. And what is your name? Carrie, future diplomat who likes craft beer. Okay. Future diplomat, really? Yep. That's great. <laughs> How does one become a diplomat? So you have to take a test. There's a whole bunch of. You know, I have. A, okay, well, this is another story. Associated that I don't need to. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So, <laughs> so, a future, so a future diplomat who likes craft beer. Well, I like craft beer too. We have that in common. Um, and I guess as a future diplomat, and you were seeking to say perhaps brand yourself, and I don't know if that is your goal or not. Um, it is. How I mean, then, then you have it always is. always is right, and so you want to create a narrative about that, and like, what would that look like? We're going to talk about that as well. Anyone else? Anyone else want to offer up their story? Any other cool millennial, sleek, austere, modern people, or perhaps somebody who flies and defines that? I do not know. 
No, I say no, sir, to capitalism. I, I am a rugged, down-to-earth individual. I bootstrap myself. And screw your cufflinks. None of those in here? No? Nobody? Not even one? I ride a motorcycle. I drink whiskey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we all do, hopefully. You all should. Um, and once you're over 21, if you're over 21. <laughs> That's on the camera. So. Um, I gave the caveat. So what is your story? What we need to do then is then identify what defines us, what makes us unique, what gives us an advantage, why is it important, why is our story important? I just told you why, right? Because we need to consider how our story will stand out from all the others, right? This is the unfortunate side effect of the uh, everybody gets a gold star education of youth, right? Everybody's special. Everybody gets to play. Okay, well, everybody can play, but not everybody gets to win. Oh, wait, no, everybody gets to win, too. Everybody's a beautiful snowflake. One snowflake against a war of snowflakes. It's a beautiful battle. Um, how do you stand out from others? Any ideas? Any suggestions? Do research. Do okay. Do research. Sure. Yeah. People are lazy. That's true. People don't like to work hard. Say anything good in life, you got to work hard for it. It's absolutely true. Beyond the scope of this class, but in this class as well. Um, do some research. Understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. Yes. Explore your specific, unique interests or talents. Explore your yeah exactly, and and then also know well know that's like kind of knowing your story, right? Like. I find it very interesting in branding, and even though this is like a pro-branding, I will help you brand yourself class, I think I find it very interesting that we tend to, especially in modernity, in creative, sort of, I guess, like careers, what do you do? Well, I do. I say, hey, you see. Well, I do other things, too. I brew craft beer, and I like to whittle, you know, like, kachina dolls, and, you know, I like to go for bike rides around, but no, no, but what do you do? This is so the stories that we're constructing about ourselves, right? That's the whole idea of like social media identity plays into that, but that's another discussion. Um, as we brand ourselves, and as we saw in some of these brands that we were talking about, this is true, I guess, of companies and individuals. At the end of the day, this is all more pointed towards us as individuals, but the brands have done it to such an infinite degree where all the arrows are pointing in the same direction. Everything in these recursive sort of feedback loops of branding and intentionality. How does branding, our narrative, our story, how we present ourselves, how does that influence our perception and our pricing? And pricing is part of it. Anybody, anybody, do my, do my job for me. Um, I'd say branding is important because at the end of the day, going back to your previous question, you only stand up from the others because you say you're different from them. You're actually not really that different. Everybody hear that? Let me give you a little microphone. Um, you can take over. I'll sit down. You take over. Um, exactly right. Because we're always seeking. The, one of the core things of branding, both the corporate realm and the individual realm, is how are you different? What makes me different? What makes me unique? When you have 30 million people all screaming at you, I'm unique, you can understand why there's resumes flying in. Like I have friends who are hiring for stuff. Like, we got like 3,000 resumes. How are we even going to go through all that? Everybody's a super talented graphic designer, this young, aspirational, well-traveled, speaks a couple languages, smart. Everybody's incredible. How do you make yourself stand out in that effulgence of, of overachievement? <laughs> some, some, of that, some of that has to be made up. I can't believe that's all true. Um, do you really speak Mandarin? I guess I wouldn't know. Um, but obviously, <laughs> as, <laughs> as Brandon... So obviously you can understand how branding then, the way it affects how people perceive us, right? Obviously. How can different brands speak to different markets? What markets are we trying to be a part of? And how will you cater your brand to become part of that market? Can somebody give me an example? McDonald's in India? McDonald's in India? Okay, actually, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was a corporate, actually, yeah, I was thinking like individual, but yeah. But no, but that's a great example. Yeah, it's like, how, do, how does McDonald's influence? How did McDonald's infiltrate, you know, non-Western markets? But they did, right? So, because they got some people working on their clock in the way. How do we as individuals cater ourselves to specific markets? I would say, I would venture to guess probably most people in here in terms of their personal branding are kind of after a similar market, right? 
right? We're all here at USC because they're all kind of after a similar market, right? Probably. Different colors of the same sort of thing. Variations on a theme, I think is the term. In an age of accelerating product proliferation, enormous customer choice, and growing clutter and clamor in the marketplace, a great brand is a necessity. Somebody tell me what that means. Try and stand out again. Because everybody's standing up and screaming. And so it's like, well, why do you do? Maybe you're the one that's quiet. Maybe you're the one that stands up taller. I don't know, but you got to figure out some other way. In other words, you better have a clear, intentional, and concise story. Don't get lost in the weeds. Talking about how I went on this vision quest, and then I did this, and then I trained with this guy. And this is, what's story? I'm aspirational. I'm aloof. I'm a noble. Mystery. Right? Any questions about that? Concise story, right? How to brand yourself, like how you design things, how you describe yourself, how you sell yourself. And to talk about personal branding, the same way that we talk on a much larger macro scale for corporate branding, that starts at, you know, people say, well, you know, I took, I took a, two semesters of logo design, and now I know how to make a logo. Okay, well, great, but it starts with that, but then what does that say? And then your typeface choice and your color choice. What is your, back when there were letterheads, there's still letterheads, digital letterheads. Letterhead design, right? All these things. I remember designing these things in college. But like letterheads. People still use those? That was a long time ago. How does how do these rules that we've been talking about, these flavors and things that we were talking about, corporate branding apply to individuals, guys? How do we take some of those? Keep in mind also it's inherently different because a corporate brand is trying to cater to as many people as possible. It's sort of a rip inverse mirror image of it, right? Because a corporate brand wants to like cast a wide net as possible. Whereas with personal branding, you want to make it all about one person. Because you, and then you want to serve as many people as possible. Right? Any idea about this? I mean, we've kind of been talking about it the whole time, so. Well, let's have a look. Let's take a look at a couple of small companies, individual brands. And then what I want to do is I want to take a look at their website, maybe their Instagram, and I want you guys to tell me what their brand is, what their story is. You guys want to do that? It's fun. It's a good way of sort of like seeing it. These are some people that I dug up. Um, here, here's a website for a production company that I thought was pretty cool. I'm going to turn down the lights a little bit. Is that how you make it big? Yeah. yeah. Are there light switch controls? Is it possible to turn it down a little bit? Thank you. America. Perfect. If you guys fall asleep, that's okay. I won't hold it against you. You guys can go to this website too if you want your laptops. On it's called Femme Fatale. So what does this say? We are a creative studio focusing on culture, luxury. That's a key word. Editorial, also luxury. And art, also luxury. Somewhere, somewhere between sophistication and simplicity. So this is the most luxurious brand in the world. Look at the design. Look at this website. Animation, art direction, content production. Here's their little team. What is this website telling us about them? Creative technologist. What does that mean? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't, I, I don't need to know. All I need to know is that he is a creative technologist. And wow, those words are impressive. And wow, we should hire him. He's a creative technologist. Now, unfortunately, we're in the market, at least the people, the, my fellow creatives in here and other people who are interested in personal branding stuff, we are in the market of calling bullshit a lot, right? Including on ourselves. Because what's the, what's the old, you can't bullshit a bullshitter, is that what the joke is? <laughs> right? You can't con a con man? Because that's what we do. We're constantly weaving intricate stories and really a bunch of lies. It's stories. You know, to cater to whatever we're trying to do. This person needs that thing done, he needs to feel like this, boom, we can do that. We traffic in manipulation, in meaning, in encoding significance, in intentionality, right? I think so. 
So what is this what is this website about? What are these guys about? Let's take a look at their Instagram. Maybe that'll help. Uh-huh. They're a production company, so they cater to a client, in which many ways in which us as individuals do. Let's take a look at their Instagram, which is really at this point one of the main vehicles for creating, right, like a social media presence, like Instagram. You don't need a Facebook, you don't need a YouTube, but you have to have an Instagram. Right? See, I have audio on their feed. It's all very cool. Talk to me about this. What am I looking at? Edgy. <laughs> Edgy. Let's see, this is. Mm -hmm. But kitschy, intentionally kitschy, can yeah. be cool, right? Yeah. Those ones are cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you will not be hiring Femme Fatale then. <laughs> Um, Their website looks better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, and why is that, do you think? It's just the work doesn't hold up to the super glossy black. Like Very black and white, cool, beautiful woman, hair slicked back. She looks like the girls from that, from the, was it, what's uh, Richard Palmer, Addicted to Love? Do you guys, anybody get that reference? Addicted to Love? Yeah, you get it. It's, it's incredible. I should look at the photo just to show you guys. It's incredible. It's these girls. And they're sort of like the, um, what's the name of that illustrator from the 80s? And it's Nagel. Patrick Nagel, right? He did all those white-faced women that you'd see like on the sides of like nail salons and like hair salons. These beautiful supermodels and their hair slipped back and red, red lipstick and a white blouse and black pencil skirt. They're playing their instruments. Anyway, lost reference, but you guys should look it up. It's really, it's really, it's really something. Um, so okay, so the, <laughs> so at this point we're saying their social media presence does not live up to the super cool glossy. Now that's ultimately probably because they have to serve, cater to the client, right? But their branding as an individual brand back here, wow. I mean, that's cool. I think that's cool. Anyway, let's check out somebody else. Look at this guy. Guten Tag. Incredibly different, isn't it? Also, what? It is called. I'm sorry. It is uh, Arturo Ibiwa. Yeah, I can zoom in on that. Dot com. If you want to check it out. And the other one was called. Uh, I'll, I'll click over in a minute. If you guys want to check it out. It's called Femme Fatale Studio, but the actual. This was called femfatale.paris. If you want it in English, you got to add the rest. <laughs> okay. So what does this guy do? What's this website about? Who's this guy? Just right off the top. How is this different from the last website? Come on. It's much more um, colorful and dynamic. Colorful and dynamic as opposed to static and aloof and minimalist, austere. Friendly. Yes, a very important term. Did anybody else see that? I would not have called the Femme Fatale website a particularly endearing or lighthearted website. That is the kind of room you walk into and there's no furniture and there's a beautiful woman in the corner that you're not sure she's alive. She might be a statue. <laughs> and when you, you walk in and you're just not really sure where to put down your bag and, and the air, you don't exhale so much as the air is pulled from your lungs, right? the severity of their coolness. This is very different. This is a room we walk into, which is welcoming. It's fun. It's like a guy standing there, he'll shake your hand, have a talk with you. And why is that? What is the difference between those two websites, those two sets of branding? What, is, what are those two narratives? I just gave you a couple of narratives I came up with. Do you think I'm far off? How did I cook up all that story? How did I cook up the story about a blank white room with a beautiful, you know, austere supermodel slash you know, silhouette in the corner and, you know, being cold and uncomfortable, but, oh my God, I'm impressed by how cool it is. How did I cook that up in my head? Because that's what they're giving me. Because that's what they're giving me, and how are they giving it to me? Through their brand. Through their brand. Through the colors, through the typeface, through the story, right? When you have that Richard Palmer girl, so she's robed and shattered, oh my God, she's so beautiful, but she's like, she's in a glass case, and I can never touch her, I can never be that beautiful. Such a loathsome, fleshy being compared to her. This is very different, though. Playful. Playful. Friendly. Mm. 
Who is this guy? He's got a friendly tongue. Well, yeah, you know, I do want to find out. The colors. He's a multiple disciplinary designer. So he's a graphic designer who works in web and other stuff like that. He's like a creative technologist. Another one of these great made-up job titles that we that we're coming up with. Our generation is tasked with creating all sorts of new job titles. Um, so a very different tone. Tells you very clearly what he says, what he does. He's also an individual. The other one's a production company, so maybe they're more, a little more concerned with like service and client, make them look cool, but wow, what a difference. And this site's more like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, perhaps intentionally so. There's always like that line where you have to ask yourself, how much of this was intentional, how much of it wasn't. I think as creative professionals, we have to assume and expect that everything is intentional from ourselves and from other people, because there's no other way of really being able to grasp what the story is, what the branding is, what the lies are that are being thrown at you, or the I'm sorry, artifice that's being thrown at you. Um, okay, let's do let's just do a couple more, and then we'll call it, and then we'll move on. I've talked too long. Is this helping you guys, right? Are you, is this helping at all? Like this discussion of branding, narrative, all this stuff? Here's one. Here's another experience. If you guys have any questions about this stuff in general, or, or like other things in general, like interrupt me, stop me. Like I'm just trying to, you know, teach you guys a little something, or share my experience rather, because I mean whatever. Wow. You obviously need to know a little bit about web design to kind of sort of present yourself. Online. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In but, this capacity, yes. Yes. Or have a friend who knows a lot about it. So, say, but the thing is, how do you, what if you're not really well equipped in that? So, how do you go about doing that? Um, but We're going to get to that. Press, yeah. We're going to get to that. What's that? Yeah, WordPress. <laughs> WordPress, yes. You're, you're stuck with WordPress, with the, like the rest of us. Um, but that still comes with limits, doesn't it? What does not? There's yeah. and design apps. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. But I think right now what's important is like, I know obviously some of this stuff is like, wow, like I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I know people who probably know how to do that. Um, but it's not really about this product. It's not about the artifice. It's about the underlying design elements and narrative. That's what I'm trying to get across right now. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the technical aspect, like what I was hoping to do is at the end of the class send everybody home and then over the course of next week have you guys, and some of you probably have very developed personal brands, but work on your personal brand, bring something back for us to look at that talks about your personal brand, what you offer, what makes you different, your story, and you, utilizing some of the stuff we're talking about now and some of the stuff we're going to talk about in the next hour. And then in terms of like technical stuff, I can sit with you and we'll, we'll have a little section at the end of it where I can sit down and say, well, here's, let's talk about Photoshop. I can use Photoshop to do that. Let's talk about Illustrator. I can use Illustrator to do that. There's a lot of people in here, so I might not be able to answer everything, but I think I can address some specific questions and then do a tech, give you like a little tech demo up on the screen and you guys can follow. Um, okay. I like the part that changes his description of who he is underneath freelance design. Yeah. I think that's really clever. It is clever. What would you say? What would you say the story is with this website? Well, who is this guy? Besides clever, I'll admit that's part of it. Let's go to about. Now this is all very visually impressive, but it's not, again, it's not about like, oh shoot, how the heck do I do that? <laughs> it's about like, what is he telling me about himself? And how is he telling it? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, regardless, I mean, there's a lot of motion. To be honest, to be honest, it's kind of schizophrenic. Like, yeah, it's, it's kind of yeah. touching my eyes now. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think it's a hazard for epileptic. Yeah, actually, it's, it's super I'm glad you picked up on that, yes. This is the opposite of the clean, austere, middle. and and even then, it's, it's designed very tastefully, nice color selection. The green's a little hard to read against the white. I probably would have gone with something else. Yeah. It's very cool and edgy, but it's kind of hard to read. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's like a show-off. But, yeah. yeah. but it's like yeah. overwhelming. Uh -huh. Exactly. Okay, it gives me anxiety. Yeah. It gives me anxiety too. It's like some weird Radiohead video that I'm not really comfortable. With. And <laughs> I don't know if you guys you guys might not remember this, but like back in the day, radio. It might still be true, but Radiohead made its website into like an art exper experience, and you had to go and you're trying to like find out when the show is. And like I'm never gonna find it. It's like a million different websites, a point different things. It was terrifying. 
Anyway, okay, so they're perhaps an example of like maybe very intentional. We have to assume it's intentional, but not very effective, Brandon. Because all this says to me is like, wow, you're very, you have a lot of technical mastery, but oh man, that's hard to read. Like, I'm sure there's a niche of people that appreciate. There is a niche. Well, there's a niche of people that appreciate almost anything. <laughs> And I'm just using this through the web because I think the web is a great way to sort of like see an all-encompassing kind of branding, like uh, artificial package, like of artifice. Um, this is all done in smaller parts in your Instagram, you know, in your in your gra personal graphic design, in your you know, cards, and everything else that you do, in your product, the way that you brand your product, your logo. What does this say right off the bat? Melanie. Mm -hmm. But how, let me look at the layout, look at the colors, look at, how is this different from the other ones we've looked at? It's less sleek. It's more sweet. There's a lot on there, like a lot of text. Yeah, there's a lot of text. It's very small, that's for it's sure. It's like an illustrator. Something like that, I believe so. She does art direction and UX design. The little charming sort of hand wrought elements, like this image, this contrast of colors, especially with the white. Very warm, welcoming, I would say playful. Look at his typeface choice. She should have zoomed in more. It is very small. But this, is, this website is for very young and trendy people. If you need or have eye problems, well, then you need not apply. <laughs> if you're over the age of 21, you need not apply. Um, and then she goes on to some of her work. I would say this one strikes a pretty good balance. Um, I, I do think the type is too small. But there's, <laughs> there's like this joke about you know, the harder it is to read, well, that just means it's more exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's more status. Right? All right. Um, <laughs> maybe just a couple more, just extreme examples of personal branding. This guy's, uh, I think he's Korean. He lives in France. And there might be audio. I think there's audio. Let's see if it comes through. Raised by the 80s. So what is this? What is this telling us about this guy? Definitely a sub, a sub genre. Okay, yeah, let's let's shut up. Also, let's stop that. Okay, let's stop. Um, so, what is this saying about this guy? Look at the way he describes himself: digital art director, born in Seoul, living in Paris. There's that international, well-traveled bent, raised by the '80s. Okay, well, I can see that, um, which is strange to me, which means he must be like in '40s, maybe. 13 years of experience, but only 13 years of experience, I thought that was a strange way of doing things. Now available for you. All this, and this video thing is very impressive. So it's like raised by the 80s, and he's like influenced by the, the, the time period. It's not necessarily mean that but I, but I feel like then it would be influenced by the 80s, or created by the 80s, curated by the 80s, taught by the 80s. Raised by the 80s means like that's what he saw as a child. Mm -hmm. no, I don't know. I mean, this is an open discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, oh, okay. <laughs> born in the 80s could be possible around like 30, right? Well, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I was born in 1983. I'm 34. But I feel like I grew up born in the 90s. And this is just, I'm just saying that that's something when he said that, when he just self-described it, I'm like, well, how old is this guy? Um, but very impressive. He does video and artwork. A lot of cool video links. What is this guy's brand? What is his story? Retro, it's a very specific and acute style. This is what we as individual creatives call style, but right? You know, it's interesting because like, uh, the first band, it seems really retro, but then can you look at Yeah, the it's all modern, yeah. yeah. It's all really futuristic yeah. and more touristic. Uh, yeah, exactly. Here it's a tire ad. But this is his work. Again, we have to like service clients as his portfolio, but his personal style, his personal branding, yeah, again, it's a very 80s kind of anime Akira thing going on, which if you guys have never seen, you should watch. It's incredible. Um, here he's doing something for a fragrance, who knows what, whatever, congratulations. Um, okay. Do you have any examples of like non, like UI 
artifacts or graphic designer because I feel like most of the stuff we've looked into is, and I know like those are the people who have usually like personal brands and freelancers mm -hmm. but like what if you're not like what if you're like aspiring to be a diplomat you know what I mean well that, that's fine I mean I feel like I don't the thing is like a lot of times aspiring diplomats don't have like such robust or like clear and evident personal brands or website and I know that these guys are obviously all people who work in tech and graphics and UX and it's not so much about the fact that that's what they do and this is what you all do and that's why it's relevant. It's about seeing how they're using color, typeface, okay. design to tell a story. And so the point, what I want you guys to take away from it is that you know how to tell that story, whatever it is. The next section is to start talking about a little bit about like basics of design and stuff like that. So okay. Does that, does that answer your question? I not yeah. really, but it's okay. I think well, it also depends on what you're going for. So like, for example, for me, it would make sense for me to have a website because yeah. no one's going to go to a diplomat's website to hire them, yeah. per se, whereas like Twitter might be the main source there, but it's like I would need to brand my Twitter with something. And you still have the underlying cool. principles that yeah. come through and whatever whatever vehicle you're trying to put out. So it's finding whatever platform works for you and like graphic designers, this is how like I used to hire graphic designers, mm -hmm. like I would go to their website and look at their portfolio and see what they've done. Mm -hmm. So. And see all their brands. Yeah. Did somebody say this? Uh, I was just going to say, kind of like building off what you were saying. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Basically, if you're going to be a freelancer, it's not only just your personal brand that you're trying to get across, you're advertising everything you can do so, so you want to get hired. So if you're going to work in a very, I don't know, like rigid or corporate or... Yeah, you're going to have a much more muted, yeah, muted personal brand. Yeah. So, but I think it's also ultimately like everybody brands themselves to some degree in social media and all that, but also especially as people who are involved in any sort of creative realm, um, which I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm incorrect in assuming that a lot of you are, because I'm guessing most of you are Anna Briggs students, but I don't know. Do you have something to miss? I have a question. So yeah. I can finish your thought. Okay. Um, it's very important to be able to know how to brand yourself and then at the very least be able to speak that language and see the elements of that process for what they are. So to answer your question about like, well, what about if I'm not a UX designer? What about if I'm just a... I'm a lawyer. I want to brand myself. Okay, that's great. Well, yeah, the underlying principles of design and intentionality are still going to be needed to do that. These are very flashy, extreme examples, you know, because I thought I was trying to drive the point home. Miss? Yeah, I'd like to know how necessary is it for you to include yourself in your brand if you're selling products? Because at one point, I kind of want to sell the lifestyle of being organic, but at another another part of me wants to be a little, I just want to have my life a little private, Yeah. so I don't really want to be doing Instagram yeah. lives and stuff like that. Welcome to the schizophrenia of the freelance gig generation. I am selling myself, but dear God, I don't want to be that person. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to eat pizza rolls and watch Netflix. Yeah, I want to have like a Tom's type of product line, mm -hmm. but with the same type of philanthropy message, mm -hmm. but I don't want people all in yeah, exactly. Well, I, and I think that if you have, if for those of you who are here coming from it, and this is again, we have to serve like a lot of different like interests and facets of this coming into this and in different skill levels. So appreciate your patience and trying to like field all of that. Um, I think that if, if you have a product, for those of you who are here with a company or an idea or an app or who knows what else, you say, well, how do I brand this right? This has helped a little bit. Some of the basics of design that we're about to get into are going to help as well. Um, but in terms of your question about how do I separate myself from that, these examples I gave you are all individuals, creative individuals, and or small companies. But once you have a company, it's just like the examples that we took earlier, that's why we had the corporate example earlier, where it's like, the, you know, the guy who started Tom's, a, even though I know he's of some notoriety and he's like sort of made himself a public figure a little bit, but he's not on there. It's not talking about him and his life. It's about the product. It's about Tom's. So whatever product that you have that aspires to that sort of organic, healthy, holistic lifestyle, It'll have its social media accounts, it'll have its branding, it'll have its logo, it'll have its identity, it'll have its narrative, and all the colors and textures and typefaces that go with that to support that message and that story. But that doesn't have to have anything to do with you. Because it doesn't have to be inherently tied or explicitly tied to you. You know, you may be pulling the strings, but it's not you that you're selling, right? It's a product. I don't think it's necessary for you to include yourself. I think it's important to have something that says, who's doing this, so that there's a face attached to it. But there's a big difference between having, and I see I'll be right with you, I, I, I think there's a big difference between having a photo of yourself on the about page and say, this is who I am, and, and I love this and that, and that's it, 
with no connection to your personal life and having it be like, well, the whole thing's about me and on the front page it's you and like you doing cool things. Like, I don't want that. Well, you don't have to have that. Okay. You don't have to have, they can be two very separate things. Miss? I think, uh, just a comment, I think it's also choice. I mean, if you think about Apple, for a long time they, you know, they built their brand around like Steve Jobs. Yeah. And there are like other brands like, where they're like completely anonymous. Mm -hmm. There's even like this, uh, this one fashion brand, Martin Magella, and they, what they did for a long time, they kind of, their designer was anonymous and they kind of built around this kind of, you know, kind there of played go. with that, that mm -hmm. he was. Well, that's, that's certainly, yeah, that's, I mean, there you go. So, to, to the exact extreme opposite. So, yeah, it is very much a choice. If any of you are concerned about that, it's like, well, what about, I'm not worried about branding myself. I'm worried about branding a product or something. Are there other people in here who are interested in that, like branding a product or an app or something as opposed to individuals? Just like to get, like, no? Are, uh, who in here is interested in terms of, like, personal branding? Okay. And some of you are just interested in something just wandered in. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. You're going to have a good time. Um, Okay, well, let's get on with it. Um, so, as individuals slash brands slash small companies, where do we tell our stories? That's right. She guessed it. Um, and then it's all, like some of the companies that we talked about earlier, um, they have, you know, Instagram accounts, they have social media accounts, all of these different little icons. Um, web pages, commercials, ads. As individuals, it's mostly social media, right? That's where we find great traction in terms of pushing our brand and story forward. Um, it all happens on the internet. Um, and actually, to that effect, I mean, if you looked at some of the Instagram accounts for the brands that we talked about earlier, they do their best to try to live up to that. You know, Nike has all cool pictures of shoes and cool young athletic people doing cool things in urban environments, being healthy, and REI has you know, independence and all these things. And they're all pushing, pushing, pushing. Because part of the brand narrative is that all the arrows in the brand have to point in the same direction, all pointing at the same pearl of narrative that you've wrapped your brand around. Which is why it's so damning and, you know, so useful at the same time as, as individuals. For those of you who hear the brand personally, I've done it many times. Um, for example, what do I have to offer? What is special about me? What's special about my story? And then you have to kind of like try and, and it's, it's sometimes uncomfortable because it becomes part of you. It's like, well, then, do, do I have to dress this way? Well, yeah, maybe. As long as you I don't know. How, how committed are you to the bit? Because ultimately, it is a bit. It's a created artificial story. This is something to even more with the corporate side of it. But a great brand shouldn't be hard to find. There's a quote from, I forget, I didn't cite my source, the professor, but he's a marketing professor. I walked through a hardware store last night, and I came across 50 brands I didn't know existed. <laughs> They may be great products, but they're not great brands. What does that mean? They didn't do a good job of branding because he didn't know who they He didn't know their story. He didn't know what they meant. If you go and walk down the hardware aisle, I, I, you know, I know a lot of hardware brands. It's like, well, this is great. Whatever Diablo brand, you know, buzz saw blades. Cool, it's a buzz saw blade. It's this color as opposed to that color. It's this cost as opposed to that cost. But that doesn't really tell me anything about the brand. It's not a, a great, iconic brand like some of the ones that we talked about earlier. Um, and this is both, next to these, some of these are trying, I'm trying to ride the line between company brands and personal brands with all this stuff, so meet me halfway. Um, a great brand is in it for the long haul, right? And that's more like corporate brands, right? They, they, they're trying to be established and know, you know who they are. Really it can be just about anything. Like what is the brand Intel? We're all familiar with Intel, right? Intel Inside. But I don't know the first thing about a you know, processor. I can't tell one processor from another. What we're buying is their brand, right? Because we know that Intel Inside makes a better computer. Don't we? Does anybody know the biggest competitor for Intel? Anybody know what a company called AMD is? Who knows what AMD is? Yeah, like two people. Exactly. <laughs> because Intel did a very good job. Sorry, I'm just going to raise this. Try 
I don't know how to use this thing. I know, it's okay. I wanted to get it like half dark. Yeah, that's it. You got it. Thank you. Okay, uh, so yeah, it, the Intel. We don't know what we're buying. We just know that it's Intel. It's better when it's inside our computer, right? AMD, by the way, is that company. It's another huge chip processor, um, but nobody knows about them. There's no AMD inside. Um, knows itself. What it sells and who it sells it to has a quote-unquote soul, like a story. And that's just as true for us as individuals as it is for companies. <coughs> whatever your brand is, whatever your story is, what are you selling and who are you selling it to? And what's the best way to sell it to them? Obviously, Femme Fatale thinks that they, well, they're French too, so they are very cool. But they think that the best way of selling is to be the sheer, you know, austere company. The water just slides off, though, because they're so slick. Um, taps into emotions. Remember, we were talking about stories and narratives. Jordan, Air Jordan, right? Achievement, victory, Nestle, familiarity, safety, home and heart. Emotions like happiness or emotions like subversion, obey. Which is funny because that guy taught here for a while. Uh, is consistent and intentional. A brand, quote unquote, and design, quote unquote, are one and the same. Logos, colors, etc. It's all design, right? Intentionality of design. Which, as it so happens, we're about to talk to you right talk about right now. So let's go over some basics. Who here has a has a background in design or graphics or anything like that? Art, anything creative? Let me see. Raise your hands. One, two. Okay, we'll go outside. Three, kind of, kind of, sort of. Half and half, half and half. Okay. Well, in that case, this will be hopefully useful to more people. Um, I was expecting more people to come from sort of a graphics background, but that's the fun of it. Um, all right. Well, then, for you three people and myself included, we've known all these things for a long time. Um, but here's a good refresher course. And a lot of this has to do in terms of this is sort of like pan design, right? Which is sort of like a box made visual, right? So this could be true for graphics, it could be true for web stuff, it could be true for print, logos. These are sort of overarching concepts. So very, very general. I will run through them. Please ask me questions if you would like. Um, line. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I'm saying line? And perhaps how you can see it in these images? The artistic concept of line. They're often used to convey and or organize visual information. I mean, it's not a trick question. I'm just talking about like lines, you know, like this line there, like that line there, like the rows. The different sort of connotations in design, we deal a lot with connotations of color and of design, so like the division between, and this, a lot of this is kind of like, I don't know if I completely agree with it, but like the difference between a vertical line and a horizontal line versus a diagonal line. Any of our design people want to comment on that? The idea being that an active line is <clears throat> uh, energetic, alert, and a horizontal line is more stable. A, a, a horizontal, a um, diagonal line is dynamic in action. Who knows? This is something they do. It's like when they say like red means anger and blue means peaceful. Like sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes. Shape, line and shape. If you guys took like a basic drawing or intuitive graphic design, these are things you guys would be talking about. What am I talking about when I say shape? Not a trick question. Very very simple. But it is. I guess sort of like specialized language. Um, just that, it's shape. So in these two examples of like a website design, this again conveys the same thing with graphics design, your logo, your, all your stuff, the way that you portray yourself graphically, visually. Um, this Basecamp website uses these little cartoons and soft round typeface, round shapes. It's a lot more friendlier. A lot friendlier, more perhaps a little uh, lighthearted. Whereas the Squarespace goes much more the femme fatale road. It's like very white, black, monochromatic, a lot of like hard lines, shape. Organic versus artificial shape versus geometric graphic shapes. Any question about that? These are, again, very, very general stuff. But it's like, what I, I, you have to say about like geometrics versus? Organics? Mm -hmm. I would say that geometric shape, generally speaking, there's been this whole trend, a rash of geometries, and they infiltrated the graphic design world. Now all we do is triangles and tetrahedrons and hexagons and all this. Um, I would say that those convey a little bit more of a coldness, a minimalist, austere, modernist, 
stability, static, perhaps. Whereas organic shapes are generally a little more fun and like easygoing and like I watch a cartoon every now and again. Anybody agree, disagree? Can you say that one more time? Which one? Just the last. The last part? I would say that, I would say that uh, geometric shapes and graphic shapes in general convey a sense of, uh, of non-movement, like static, a static sense. Stability, they're kind of a little bit more artificial, non-biological. As opposed to like organic shapes, kidney beans, you know, squiggly lines, circles. These things are a little bit more welcoming, a little more organic, a little bit more lighthearted. And that's what I pointed out with these two examples. Just a, a website design, but again, they're principles of design. There's also texture. Um, it's not quite dark enough to see. I could try and do it, but I'm going to mess it up again. But, <laughs> but visual texture, which means also visual complexity, and also usually really what it means is just the visual uh, representation of actual texture. So if you have like the picture of an elephant, it's like very textural. That's a lot of visual texture, and that's something you can use as well to convey a sense of actual texture, like tactility. Also visual complexity, which the eye is drawn to. Contrast as well, we'll talk about that in a minute. And there's a bit, also a big difference in representing something like, remember that uh, the Apple website? We were looking at the iPhones, it's, oh my god, this thing's so glossy, so perfect. Nobody has ever touched that phone. It is so reflective and shiny and glossy. That's texture. Versus if we had a picture of like a pair of old jeans, right? Like on the Tom's website, or like those boots on the Tom's website. Color. This is a big one. What are we talking about when I say that color is one of the basic elements of design? Why would that be? Emotion. Emotion. Now that's interesting you say that. I agree with you. You're right. But why? What does color have to do with emotion? It represents certain things. It represents certain things. It represents certain things to different, certain things to certain people. Right? Culturally, in the West, we connote different things with different colors. Right? White, purity heaven, a wedding, or a Korean funeral. Um, black, mystery, danger. You got something, Miss? Yeah, when I was figuring out what I wanted my logo to be, mm -hmm. I did a lot of uh, research on the psychology of colors. Oh, boy. And, like, mm -hmm. how colors have been used in different uh -huh, yeah. to appeal to maybe kids or older people, and it was really helpful. Yeah, it's very interesting. But it's also very interesting to consider that even right now, contemporaneously, the same color can mean vastly different things in different cultures, right? Um, but yeah, you know, in the West, it's like red is passion and blood, but it's also anger. Green is life and renewal, but also envy. Where'd that come from? Who knows? <laughs> you know, blue, tranquility, calm, but also depression and sadness, right? This is the, yeah, the psychology of color and the things that we connote with, and people do that. This is actually, are you guys, anybody here familiar with Pantone? Anybody know what Pantone is? It's a company that somehow got in the business of making colors. I don't know how you do this. So Joe Pantone one day in 1938 said, I'm going to make colors. And so he started the Pantone Corporation, and we got colors. But they have something they do every year where they choose the color of the year. The color of this year is called, um, what's that? Um, last year was like this nice green, I forget what they called it. But millennial pink. Yes. And what does that say? Anybody familiar? Anybody here in the fashion industry? Or interested in the fashion industry? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's very well traveled. Okay. Yes, it's very cool. Um, but no, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. But yes, uh, you are as well? Were you interested in these? Uh, no, I did three years in Milan. Okay, there you go. Boston, there you go. Okay, well then you are familiar with the concept of trend reports. Does anybody, does, it, does everybody not know what trend reports are? This is something that the, fa so get this. Do you want to explain it to us? It's, a, it's, a, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, uh, we used to get them like from WGSN. Mm -hmm. So they give you some kind of like, like what's going on right now in society, but then also like, you know, what's going to happen like in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And also what's happening in the you world. Know, like psychologically, but this also translated like in colors. Mm -hmm. So the fashion design. industry decides years ahead of time what is going to be popular. You laugh, but this is absolutely true. They, they get together and they say, well, here's what's happening in society, here's what's happening in the world, here's what's happening in the news. 
Here's where we see it happening. Here's the colors that are probably going to be popular because we're going to say they're going to be popular. And they disseminate it to all designs. I know, yes, well, I agree or I disagree, but either way, I acknowledge. Trend reports. Colors. It's all part of this constructed artifice that doesn't come out of anywhere. Somewhere up there in upper echelons of the fashion world, somebody said, this will be the color. And it's like, boom, all of a sudden, five years later, it's in Target. It's well-researched, though. Yeah, it's well-researched. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I'm just saying there's... These aren't like random like instances of like personal like creative genius. Like this is all people bouncing off people, brands, brands and stories bouncing off brands and stories, and coming to this sort of weird cohesive goo, this bacterial mat of creativity that will. That's not a great metaphor. Um, anyway, so color in terms of brand, it's all about also like what color feels right for your brand, right? If you're doing something young and fun and peppy, you're not going to pick like gray, and black. That's we want to be very austere and cool, and you wear only black because you're so cool, like me. You need to do millennial pink, right? Uh, typography, this is another big one. How does typography convey a narrative? What is the difference between this very sort of obscure, banal statement in these different typefaces? Or am I asking you too many questions? Should I just tell you, please go ahead. Um, not one of the ones up there, but for example, if you take like more cursive, it reminds me of the Victorian. Mm -hmm. There's ones that look kind of like they're Gatsby, and, mm -hmm. and like there's all sorts of vibes you can get from the typography. So mm -hmm. Helvetica has become pervasive everywhere. These super cool New York font. Yeah, <laughs> and then there's one in England that's like the Helvetica of England, but I don't know what it's called. And the, like my personal favorite is Avenue. Well done. Well done. Thing. So. So um, typography can carry a lot of weight. So anybody here familiar with Comic Sans? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, okay, you all know that. Obviously, like, and think about it, if you're designing something or if you're doing something, your personal brand, you probably don't want to use Comic Sans unless you're trying to be, like, you know, goofy for some reason. And or maybe you are a clown. That is your job. <laughs> we take it seriously because your father was a clown. His father was poor. Comic Sans is actually way easier to read than any, like, sensor. Mm-hmm. But it's evil. <laughs> um, but okay, so obviously, and then also, if you think about things like, well, I'm going to convey some news. I'm, I'm not going to write something about a, you know a triple homicide in Comic Sans because that's just, that's disrespectful. You know, that elicits a response, and that's that same ability to elicit a response to typeface. So you can't like, if you want something to be bold and dramatic and just make a statement, you're going to use a big sans serif font. Um, I think I have a slide here about sans serifs, which is basically no like. Uh, here it is. Yeah. Sans. Serif is just these little diddly bobs in the ends. Without it, it's a sans serif. Right? Um, but yeah, you can say you can convey a lot of story with your typeface choice. You're trying to be bold and strong and make a big statement, or you're trying to be more delicate, perhaps, and you know, it's more gestural. Um, yeah, any questions about that? It's all pretty basic, right? You guys get that? Just real quick, because you guys will run into this if you have any creative work ever, and I wasn't sure how many of you were creative versus just not um, RGB, CMYK. Do you guys have any difference between these two color families? Yeah? This will be useful for you. RGB, adapt, additive color, everything on a screen, anything that uses light to convey color is RGB, red, green, blue. They all add up, you get white. Then there's subtractive color. This is used in print. If you ever are going to print something, a business card, a label, a who knows what, you are utilizing subtractive color. Mix it together and you get the key, black. Just two different color systems, just worth a quick mention because I figured you guys would. Yes, miss? R RGB is used for the web and mm -hmm. this is used for print. Got this it. is all stuff that is physical. This is all stuff which is digital on the screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, like, if you're going to print something, you want to use CMYK, exactly right. So um, if you have something that you need, that you know is going to be printed, you can go into Photoshop and Illustrator, I can show you how, and change the color family from, color system from RGB to CMYK. And it might look a little funny on your screen, but it'll look better when you print it out. They've, they've worked on it. They've got a whole system. Um, here's the color wheel, just real quick. Everybody's familiar with this. Very basic, but I just want to make sure I mention it because it is relevant to all aspects of design and visual narrative. Um, and you see here, it's a little bit small here, but you see it's warm, active, warm colors, right? Everybody knows between warm colors and cool colors. 
right? And they connote to different things, right? Cool, passive, warm, active. Anybody know what primary colors are? What the primary colors are? Yellow, red, and do we know why they're the primary colors? And they can't be pulled apart. There are some cool color apps for you guys that are looking to create, like especially when it comes to your personal brand or your company brand or something. You say, "Well, yeah, I'm no artist. I don't know shit about color." Well, guess what? There's somebody there. There's somebody there for you. <laughs> um, Coloradobe.com is really cool. You can use to create um, color families. They're really, really useful. You can say, like, well, this is what I want to be primary color. What colors play ball nice with that? And it'll help you. Coolers.co as well will create color fam families for you. If you're redecorating your apartment or something, there you go. And you don't like to do it on your own. There's also a really cool app called Adobe Capture, which lets you do that, where you can be in a room and say, I don't know what it is. I kind of like the vibe of this room. And you just you'll take a photo and it'll create sort of a color family of sort of the ambient colors, ambient, ambient. How do you say that? Mess. Are there any reasons why you would want to use one side over another, or is it? No, I don't know. It's just personal preference. All right. Um, I should mention very quickly in the color wheel, even though this is like very basic stuff, but just because some of you don't come from an art background, complementary colors. Everybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. That means colors which are opposite of each other in the color wheel, and they tend to have a lot of great visual contrast. Right? The eye is drawn to contrast. The eye is drawn to movement, to light and shadow to red and green, visual contrast. Um, so as you see purple and yellow, you put them together and it draws the eye. That's why a lot of times college football teams or sports teams will have complementary colors or very like a lot of areas of great visual contrast. Right. What's that? Yeah, please, please. If, you're, if you have a lot of writing and text though, you don't want to have like black on white necessarily because it makes it harder. Yeah, this is, this is this great like sort of truism in, mm -hmm. in copywriting and design, and this, this is kind of beyond the scope of this, but generally speaking, it is proven that it is easier for people to read black text on a white background over big blocks of text. There you go. Take it as you will. But for titling stuff, it's fine. This is just real quick graphic design stuff you guys could use in your branding. Tracking is the space between letters. These are all terms that come from the dark ages when people would actually put down little pieces of metal on a uh, letter press printing press, you know, they arranged them, that was a job, and that's what you did, and you woke up every day, and you went and moved around a little piece of metal, and you went to home, went to bed, got up, did it again. So it's a letter spacing between groups of letters in a paragraph. Kerning is a horizontal spacing between two characters. All right? See that? You don't want that. It's a personal brand when you're making your business cards, when you're making your letterheads, and you're making this and the other. Unless that's part of the design and intentional, you don't want it to happen. Everything has to be intentional. If something looks weird, if something looks wrong, it better be supposed to look that way. Because otherwise you're saying stuff that you don't want to be saying. And we all know how hard it is to get our, our own very intentional message across, much less whatever else people can dig out of it, right? And then there's letting. This is just so when you guys are using like Adobe products, you understand what these terms are because Adobe goes back to all the old ancestral hand wrought techniques and names of in the program. Letting is a space between lines. So called because at one point an old man would put a, a bar of lead in between the lines. There's alignment. Everybody knows what alignment is, right? Left, center, right. Here's some resources that you guys can definitely take advantage of. Please utilize these for your school, for your assignments, for your branding. These are great. Losttype.com, designers send in your typography. Some people are just typographers and they're nuts and they love creating typeface families. I don't know why. But I'm really glad they exist because they do a good job and they give it to you for free. You can pay the money if you like. LostType.com. The font is a huge resource for all sorts of esoteric, strange, but very useful typefacing as well. Yes, Miss. You said on this one they create um, types that typefaces that look good together, fonts that look good together. Is that what you? Well, think? I mean, it's up to you to decide whether or not they well, look good together. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, they're all very well designed. I see. Yes. Some of them are more esoteric and more sort of like for titles and stuff as opposed to others. Is this stuff useful to you? Is this stuff that you guys yes. can use, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, so everybody's coming from different directions, so I want to make sure everybody's getting... Are you getting what you need? What do you yeah. need? What do you need? Oh, that's a really general question. Yeah, I know, right? In terms of the class. In terms of the class. Uh, visual hierarchy. Visual hierarchy, guys, is, one of, again, one of these underlying fundamentals of design, branding, um, where it's basically, well... 
a big mistake that people tend to make who don't have training is everything is equally important on your business card, on your website, um, in, you know, however you lay things out. There has to be a clear visual hierarchy to guide the eye where to go. Here I know this is the first thing I'm going to read because it's right on blue. It's going to draw the eye. And it's also the biggest eye. Then it's going to go up here, and then it's probably going to come down around here, the details. This is the most important part. That's why it's the biggest and the most easy to see. This is the next most important part. It kind of goes around. Same with this. Boom. Important at the top. Then the rest. Also, they say in the West that we prefer to have our eye led from the left side of the page to the right side of the page. Because that's the way we read. That's what they tell us. That's what they say to me, so I believe them. Again, just touching in on visual contrast, you see the obvious difference between these two sides. Not only in terms of composition, empty, negative space, positive space, very full, but color. See how those are complementary colors? Red and blue, opposite sides of the color wheel. So it draws visual interest. Here's another one, the rule of thirds. This is, again, sort of like one of these things. Well, you know, it's, again, people have been saying it for a long time, and it kind of works, but it's one of the things you'll hear said again and again, um, and you'll be very useful in anything visual that you do. Which if you're not sure about composition, which I feel like we're all acculturated, we kind of have like a basic understanding of what works in a composition versus what doesn't, the specifics of which are beyond the scope of this class. But the rule of thirds is a good rule of thumb if you're not. Actually, I don't like using this term. It's a good. Um, it's a good guide, a guiding sort of framework, I guess, for laying out an image if you're not sure how to work. And that just means that an image plane is divided by two horizontal, two vertical. Vertical lines, and you can lay things on the lines and have the space between the lines play with each other. Any confusion there? Anybody okay? And it's some eyes glassing over. I know it's been a long time. I've been talking a long time. Um, negative space. Quite simply, it is empty space, but you can utilize it to great effect in a composition to balance things out. Again, this is more graphic stuff, but it's very, very useful in terms of copy, in terms of laying out letters, in terms of laying out lots of stuff that deals with the brand. I just want to make sure I cover all this with you. Um, does that make sense, negative space? Obviously everything here that is not really filled with anything, even though there is visual data there, this is the data, right? This is negative space. But you see how this feels balanced, this composition. It doesn't feel like it's heavy to the right. It doesn't feel like it's heavy to the left. It's not perfect, but you see how this little bit of white and content visual Complexity kind of offsets that bit up there. That could probably be a little bit bigger. That's what I can find. Repetition is another one. It's just repeating lines, textures, shapes. You see here, this will happen a lot of times in the digital layouts and print layouts. And one, two, three, four, just the visual vernacular. Very important in your brand. Everything is cohesive and ties back into itself. It repeats itself. You can choose your colors. What are the two, what are your couple of colors that define you and your brand? It's red and gold. Okay, great. Welcome, USC. Good to see you. Sit down. Um, Cardinal and gold. Um, but everything, I mean, that USC is a great example. Everything is those colors. Those colors are in everything. And it's the same typeface every time. It's the same thing every time. And even if you get kind of goofy and wild and they have like different like typefaces and different things going on in t-shirts, it's always the same logo. There's consistency in the color, in the layout, in the tone, in the feel, right? And finally... You got to know your audience. This goes back to what you're talking about in terms of like personal narrative. Who are you selling to, and what are you selling them? Right, and that's different for all of you, I'm sure. Um, but know your audience. You got to know why, and also why they want to, why they want to buy what you have. What makes you special? What makes you different? Right. A lot of that's research. I think somebody said that earlier. Um, and a lot of times, you know, sometimes it is like solid text facts where it's like, well, I know that this market likes this and that market is mostly this kind of person that makes that kind of money and lives in this kind of world. That's important. But also just knowing in terms of like who wants to buy your product. Some examples, just real quick. Um, Coca-Cola is like one of those great classic brands. This is like logo work more, but still part of branding. Very, very consistent. Same color, same swoop, same typeface, all over the place, everywhere. And they're huge. They're monolith. It's almost like impossible to like really even consider them because it's like McDonald's. So one of these companies is so huge and so everywhere. <clears throat> but it's an example. Consistency. 
Also, FedEx, I think I always like including these examples in terms of logo design just because nobody ever notices the hidden secret Easter egg in this logo, which is the arrow, right? You guys all saw that? It's kind of an old logo. I think either FedEx something else, but very simple, straight to the point. The arrow is an added little bonus. I love that. You can see here in the Shake Shack, I actually could go for a Shake Shack right about now, but again, the consistency in their presentation and the design of their branding. They got this thin, nice thin sans serif font. They've got the titling in this cursive font. You never want to use more than a couple fonts. Things just get confusing talking about visual design. And they got this very sort of iconic, literally like little icons everywhere. It's the same. Laid out a lot of white space. Any questions about that? It's got more just some uh, show posters uh, to talk about, again, design. Negative space, right? Nice, simple type. Any questions? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if this kind of seems scattershot, but it's because the, the idea of like branding is like so overarching, I'm trying to kind of touch on all elements of it. So if you guys are, have any questions, please let me know. It is a lot to think about. Um, for me, I'm fried. Um, but what I want to do is we've got about 20 minutes left. And thanks for sticking out with me. What I would like to do is... First of all, I recommend that you utilize the Annenberg DL website. Have you guys been to this website? Mm -hmm. it's, you, you don't need to be an Annenberg student. Let all, everybody. They'll just let anybody in here. Um, but it's a great website. There's a lot of tutorials very to specific issues with the specific programs of uh, the Creative Cloud. Illustrator, Photoshop, Edition, Premiere, all that stuff. So please check it out because you can probably find some useful stuff there. Also, Google is a great friend for that too. You know, the tutorial might be by some guy with an Eastern European accent, but he'll teach you how to do it. Um, I've you learned from a lot of that. Um, so what I want to do with the last 20 minutes is talk to you guys because you all individually, what I would like to do, if you, if you guys are interested in coming back next week, is send you off, have you do some of your personal branding, but obviously that means different things to you guys. So it's really hard for me because it's not a, like an organized class. I'm like, well, here you go, broad swath, do that. Um, like who's here to work on their personal brand, right? Oh, and <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> who's here? Yeah, it's okay. I've been talking a lot. You can be forgiven for missing some of them. Um, who who is here to work on their personal brand? And what does that mean to you guys? Like, what does it mean to you? I'm really trying to build my portfolio, but I'm like struggling with like what to create. Like you just said that you want us to create something, and like yeah. in my head, I'm like I don't I don't know like what I want to create, and I okay. feel like. I need like some guidance. Okay, well I can give you, a, if, if you don't know what to create, who here feels like they don't know what to create? If they were to come back next week, they would have nothing. And they'd be like, I don't know what to do. Okay, um, are you guys familiar with the, the Adobe Creative Cloud? Yes, I have okay. it, but not familiar. You're, you have, you're not familiar with it. Do you have any sort of working knowledge of it, of any of the programs? No. Not at all, okay. We can talk in a little bit. Um, but I would say for the people who don't know what to bring, do this. Come up with, write a paragraph, that says what the brand is that you're coming up with. Presumably for yourself. Write, write it out. Actually, everybody should do this because it's very helpful. It's like whatever the brand is, whether it's a brand that's for you or the brand for your company or the brand for your product, that's ugly, and say, here's what I want it to be. I want my product, I want my brand to be this. I want it to be green. I want it to be fun. I want it to be relatable. I want it to be sustainable. I want it to be whatever, adjectives. Then take that paragraph and try and make it into something visual, okay? And that can be a, does everybody know what a mood, uh, mood board is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody's familiar with that? From the world of fashion, I believe, originally? A mood board is just when you collect a bunch of different images that aren't of the object that you're making or that you're talking about, but they feel like it. They feel like it. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to design a Mac computer, I'd get pictures of stainless steel and like, pretty people in all white clothing, you know, in some austere, very modernist capital, the city of Brasilia, you know, like, or whatever. That's called a mood board. Put together a little folder of images that you get off the internet that speak to what that brand is. And then try and create something. You know, even if it's just a drawing, even if it's just a sketch, even if it's just a name that speaks to that. If you don't know what to do. And I expect something similar to that from the rest of you that come back next week and we can pull it apart and talk about it and have a lot of fun. And I will give you guys advice on how to build that brand. I'll give you my honest and earnest feedback on what I think works about that, what I think doesn't work about that. And it's all up to the base so you guys can stone me if you don't like what I have to say. <laughs>